Well, guys, I got a little bit after 8 o'clock, and uh, so good to have you guys joining in here on Tuesday night. Man, tonight is a special night going on. Um, I hope you all have had a great week. Just want to give a couple of quick updates, man. We finally were able to get everything uh, lined up with uh, the YouTube channel, and so if you guys get a chance, go check it out. Go online, uh, subscribe to the YouTube channel. Love to have you guys be a part of that. Julie, how'd I know you'd be the first one already on board, chiming in? Good to see you guys. Hey, just to let y'all know this, if you're chiming in first time for uh, for last words, let you know this, I can't, we can't hear you, all right? Can't even see you. We can read what your comments, so amens and yes and preach it. Exactly. Thumbs up, give me the heart. There you go. That's what I'm talking about. So anyway, so great already having you. Let me tell y'all what we're doing tonight. Tonight is a really special night. I got two friends of mine with me. First off, man, I got Jeff Moore, who was sitting back in his stoic phase over there. And uh, Jeff Moore has been a great friend, but it's been a big influence personally in my life. As a young youth pastor, I brought Jeff Moore and his band in a multitude of different times. And if we get any of our uh, New Braunfels people, y'all remember when we brought them into Canyon High School, I ended up ended doing uh, camps with Jeff later on and us doing uh, youth evangelism conference, 18,000 kids coming together, worshiping Jesus. Jeff, man, rocking it out there. Jeff writing tons of music, big songwriter, doing the concert stuff, writing with Stephen Curtis Chapman and so many different other people. Uh, part of Jeff's passion today is he is a hunter, fisherman, but he loves getting men together out of their elements, man, into a place where they can be safe, they can share and do life together. So Jeff, man, here with us tonight, man, going to be talking about some of the history of the Christian music, how it even went from when we used to, older people uh, watching this tonight, we used to go to all the Christian concerts, and then all of a sudden it started moving more and more to the nights of worship taking place. And Lindsay, great seeing you here tonight, girl. Um, because you know my other friend, and this is Bishop Gary Oliver. And Gary Oliver is bishop over a tabernacle of praise. And, <laughs> and those of y'all, man, in the church, you, you don't even realize how many of the songs that we have sang. I'm seeing the love, Gary. You're getting the love tonight. I see that. Uh, I see we got some Louisiana people already chiming in. And yes, we hey, we're missing you guys as well. Gary was writing the songs that were being sung inside of the church. And so we're going to share, Gary's going to share with us tonight even some of the history of how the, the worship music has changed um, inside of the church and to, to where it is today. So anyway, this whole thing really started. I'm going to jump back here a little bit and uh, so you can get the whole thing. But... Jeff and I uh, have done the pheasant hunting trip, man. He puts together this, this group, Fellowship Adventure, and uh, brings men in and just gives them an incredible time. There you go. We get to see the product right there. <laughs> and we had one time, I'm sitting with Jeff, and we're out at the fire. And Jeff, I asked you the question. I said, when did the music go from... Man, it's the concerts. Hey, we're going to see Newsboys. Hey, we're going to see Jeff Moore in the distance to these nights of worship, Hillsong, and all this other stuff. And you gave me, the, <laughs> seriously, the greatest lesson, even the specific songs and who we're doing them. And I thought, there's going to be a day where I'm going to get Jeff and we're going to record this and make this available. So... I got you tonight. All right. And first off, thanks so much, man, yeah, for having well, us, being a part of all this. Yeah, man. Well, I'm, I'm thankful that we're friends, man. So, uh, well, now I'm trying to remember it, but I would say this is that uh, I love that worship music is such a big part of people's lives today. Mm -hmm. You know, I watch it in my, uh, I have two teenage daughters, I watch the impact. That it has on, on their lives, uh, but that was not always the case, you know. I think that, you know, if some of you watching have had to explain to your children what a cassette tape is or what a vinyl <laughs> record is, you know, and uh, or now even you know CDs that are coasters or whatever, you know. It's like <laughs> right. 
<laughs> and, You're obsolete. Man. And so I guess uh, I'd start by saying that, you know, a lot of times the kind of renaissance in art and, and, and life is impacted by, oddly enough, by technology. And that's one of the things that happened in music. You know, I think when music became digital, some of you are old enough to remember Napster. When Napster launched, that opened kind of this Pandora's box of music being in a digital format. Before that, back in the day, you know, if somebody wanted, you know, one of my songs or one of Gary's songs back in the day, they had to pay fifteen dollars buy the whole CD, to buy the whole CD or the whole album or the yeah. whole cassette to get to one song and uh, there was no streaming, no Spotify, no Pandora, nothing right. like that. So um, and and there was in, in in it'll be I'll be interesting as you chime on this Gary, there was in my opinion back in, you know, the eighties and nineties a pretty clear delineation between worship music and what I would call contemporary Christian music. Right. And so CCM. I was in that CCM side of it. And so you know, we played, you know, we wrote songs about, uh, more often about horizontal relationships that were impacted by a relationship with Jesus Christ. Whereas I saw worship music as being more of vertical relationships. And I can remember in the early days, uh, people saying, hey, could you play a few praise and worship songs? And I was like, no. And it wasn't because I was proud, it was because we didn't do that. You right. know, I didn't know right. how to do it. And that was a worship leader's job, you know. And uh, interesting, the band, if there was there was a few bands that really gave me my break, you know. And the very first band I toured was this great band called Whiteheart. And then I toured the whole world of the band called Petra. Some of you guys remember Oh, my goodness, yes. And, uh, they were amazing. And, Petra, anybody? Remember? And, and, really? and Petra was the first band that kind of introduced worship music into, they, they for, in my world. Right. So they're a Christian rock band that's playing worship music. And so uh, that's where it began to change. So I'll give you my quick two minute version. Come on. Some of y'all know a band called Delirious, a British band. Delirious, uh, they released an album in the US called King of Fools. Mm -hmm. And that album had Remember. some beautiful songs. It had Shout to the North, I Want to Go Deeper, and it had a song, I Can Sing Be Love Forever. Right. Which was not right. a hit for them on that record. Really? Right. At that time, I'm recording for a label called Forefront Records. Okay. Mm -hmm. There are four primary artists in Forefront at the time us, Jeff Moore in the Distance, Rebecca St. James, Audio Adrenaline, and DC Talk. Mm -hmm. Toby McKeon, you know him as Toby Mack today, yeah. he had his own label. And on that label, he signed a band called Sonic Blood. And they were looking for some songs to record. And they had written some, their singer, awesome guy named Jeff Dayo. And they decided to record uh, I Can Sing Your Love Forever. They did uh, a band that toured with me called Out of Eden. I don't know if you remember. I did, yeah. The Black Sisters. They, uh, uh, Kimmy from that group sang with them. She had never heard the song before she came to the studio. And it became a big hit. That album sold more today than any CCM album will sell in 2017. Sold over five hundred thousand copies, and uh, and it became a this huge this huge worship song. And then all of a sudden, in my world, worship music started being played on the radio. A couple other kind of interesting things in, in my orbit happened was uh, Michael W. Smith had his own label called Rocket Town Records. Yeah, mm -hmm. they did kind of a tribute Chris, to his Chris Rice, Chris Rice, there Jenny you Owens, and they did a tribute to Michael's <coughs> music. And uh, gosh, I think you guys can Google it now, but I think that uh, I think the album was called. I want to say it was called Exodus, but I'm not sure. Anyway, uh, a bunch of different artists covered Michael W. Smith songs. One of those songs was a song called Agnes Day. Mm -hmm. Am I pronouncing that right? Yep, Agnes Day. Yep. Written by Michael, and Third Day recorded it. Yep. Third Day, and some of you know that song, but from from Third Day. Uh -huh. Right? Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. And so now Sonic Flood's biggest song is a song that was written by a band called Delirious. Mm -hmm. Third Day's biggest song is a song that was written by Michael W. Smith and not on one of their albums. And then another important album in Christian music came out called City on a Hill, which was uh if anybody goes way back with Christian music, remember a band called The Choir. Okay, it's already choir. Produced, yeah. produced it. 
And there was a song uh, on there called God of Wonders. Yep. And a good Texas band, Cayman's Call, and Matt Powell of Third Day sang that song together. And it became a global worship song. So now, th now Third Day's two big songs are not on their records. Mac, if you're watching, I hope I'm being accurate. Uh, and then Third Day recorded an album called Offerings, which was their first worship album. It became big. And that time I was touring with the Newsboys and their singer at the time and primary writer was Peter Furor. Peter was watching that. He was impacted by the worship music movement. And he began to write songs. And he wrote a song. He wrote He Reigns. You all know. Yeah. All that you have right. So and uh, so now you've got Third Day, Cadence Call, Petra. Uh, you've got all these bands that some of their biggest songs are worship songs. Well, my opinion is that that's when David Crowder and Chris Tomlin and were in high school, mm -hmm. and that's when you know, uh, and that's when Darlene Checks in Australia starting to write her songs, and, mm -hmm. and Hillsong United are kids, and they're watching and listening to this stuff, and you know, and you've got, you know, you've got uh, so many of what would be the contemporary Christian world of worship artists that grew up in that transition of CCMR is beginning to write worship songs. So that's why worship music ruined contemporary Christianity. Yeah. <laughs> no, I get it. That Man, that totally makes sense. Yeah, and then, and then I think just, uh, then once music got digitized, you know, you guys know, look at your phone, and you've got uh, Christian music alongside country music, alongside pop music, right. All of us together to mix the diet. We encourage you to, you know, eat a healthy diet, right? That's right. You know, don't just eat all the desserts. Don't just listen to all the desserts. You know, listen to music that also is foundational to your life. And that, I think that that is the world that we live in now. And in that blend, that's why I think praise and worship music is so critical. Mm -hmm. I know that when I've run into mainstream artists, and you ask them about Christian music today. What they know is they know praise and worship music. Right. Yeah. I mean, if you sit down with Beyonce and ask her what she's aware, what she thinks about Christian music, she's gonna she's gonna know worship music. The worship. Yeah. 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 And so, I think it's an not only important within our own evangelical community. I think it's very important in reaching the larger culture musically. So, Absolutely. Yeah. And and you know, I, Jeff and I have talked about this several times before. We'd go to y'all's concerts, right? And if we knew the songs, and most of the time we did, we're singing along with you. Right. Uh, but it was mainly, it was a concert, so we're going to sing these songs to you. You want to join in, join in. But with the whole worship thing, that's the whole yeah. purpose of it is right. everybody, I'm leading you, but worship, we're inviting you to join in with the worship to encounter God this way. And I like how you put that, that a lot of the music before was, was a horizontal. Right. As you know, evolution, still one of my favorites, uh, as opposed to the worship that's going, now we're singing this, God, you're the audience. Right. You're the audience. Mm -hmm. yeah. Well, that brings me to Gary. Gary Oliver, man, probably one of my favorite worship songs of all time. Celebrate Jesus. And I would sing yes. more, but I don't have the copyright money to pay Gary for that. <laughs> so I'm just going to stop right there. Use the hook. Exactly. So, That's so all I got. Is, you know, since we're not selling, it's okay. You we're okay. So. Well, Gary, you, you have, I mean, you started as just child prodigy, started playing the piano at early age, starting writing the music that was being sung inside the church. Now, I know this, for those of y'all who don't know, man, Gary has written and produced with... Uh, Reba, uh, uh, Dottie Rambo, a multitude of other people, but most people know Gary from the worship music that he's written that's still being sung uh, in the churches, man, all over the world. So for you, what is the evolution that you have seen with the worship music inside of the house, inside of the church? Uh, huh. It was an interesting journey. And uh, thanks for letting me be a part tonight, anyway. Uh, and Jeff, it's it's just great to hang out with you, man. And uh, and Gary shooting always, his very first pheasants hey. today. <laughs> just got to throw that out there, men being men. It's who we are. It was They're sending awesome. the love to you right now, Gary. It was awesome, right. too, I'm going to just tell you. 
thanks to these two guys for putting me in here. Uh, but uh, what, what really was going on in my world, I was a church kid. I was a church guy. I grew up in church. Uh, we went to church every day of our life. And, you know, my, the first time I sang in church, I was four years old. Uh, the first time I really played for the church service, I was probably about 10. And uh, so at, you know, by the time I'm 13 or 14 years old, I'm playing for a 125 voice choir. I'm singing a lot of the leads on the choir. And um, so choir music was really important to me. Those of you that love choir music, uh, you'll get that. Come and on. Um, it was the, the music that we sang. And I grew up in a Pentecostal home, a Pentecostal denomination. We were uh, probably a little more lively, you know, so our music was a little more rhythmic. Uh, and it wasn't really what I would even come close to calling like black gospel, uh, but it had a little bit of that flavor. There was a soulfulness about it. But I think there's a lot of music that's very soulful. I think bluegrass is very soulful. I think certain country songs, when they're sung, they're very soulful, you know, like Ronnie Millsap and people like that. They were so soulful in their ability to execute a song. And uh, But with all of that being said, the church that I grew up in, you know, we were still doing like, uh, you know, hymns, you know, hymnals, you know. Sure. And uh, all of a sudden, there began to be, and this is, this is like early 70s, mid 70s. I'm a lot younger than these two guys. Uh, but uh, <laughs> I'm just, the, in, the, in this time frame, we were seeing the charismatic renewal was really hitting hard. So we're seeing... Uh, Catholic people receiving the baptism of the Holy Spirit, which was something I grew up around. So, uh, and then Baptist churches, Southern Baptist churches, whole churches are just being filled with the Holy Spirit. So there's a newness, there's a new awareness of God and His presence and His Spirit. And um, when you discover that all of this life that we do right here is really about presence, mm. that's where it changes everything. I think from from that kind of horizontal, which is not, there's nothing wrong with that. We need that music. Agreed. We need what you did for us. Agreed. Agreed. And we still need it. We still need good songs about life, about living life. I need to just listen to songs that tell me a testimony, a story, you know, and I think we get some of that more from country music now mm -hmm. than we even do from the CCM. Yeah. And uh, so, but I think that that, all of that was very, very uh, viable in this whole transition because it opened the mind of the church up to there's something different out here and if we don't do something different we're going to lose our kids we're going to lose young people we're going to lose so i remember the um, some of the first praise and worship that i heard praise and worship were little songs that were like little jingles almost they they weren't really what we would call a song it was almost like you know two or three lines it would just do two you know over and over you know or an a section and a b section you know and um you know, we would, and everybody clapped on one and three, you know, da, 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 da. and they jumped and they danced and it was fun. But in our church, that was a, the, the rhythm was totally different. So those songs to me didn't have um, enough grease on them or whatever, you know. So we, I started writing music at an early age because I wanted something that was a little bit different, you know. And um, now, so. Uh, tell, tell me this, because. I know at least my denomination that I, I grew up in. We, we were on the hymns also, right? No right. Lie, and I love the hymns. Right. So much incredible theology in the hymns. It's a great way to But, that, there you go, that's exactly right. But, it seemed like so much of the hymns were still vertical. Right. I, I'm a part of the army of God. Let's, you know, everything we were singing was singing about God. Right. And I know within me, Gary, in, in church in the early 80s, I was hungry to sing to God. Right. And I think there's a difference because I think all praise is verb, is, is uh, horizontal. All praises, that's where I'm telling you my testimony. When I'm singing celebrate Jesus, celebrate, that's pretty horizontal. I'm not singing that to him. I'm mm -hmm. singing that to you about him. Let's celebrate him. Why? Because he's risen and he lives forevermore. And then we go into worship songs and we start singing worship songs and all of a sudden the whole vibe changes and it goes to that vertical, and vertical singing, now. you know, welcome into this place, you know, welcome into this broken vessel. And we start singing those kind of songs and it changes the whole atmosphere. I think 
everybody cries to sing those kind of songs because it makes it so personal with God and myself. But the thing for me was just writing something that had just a little more, you know, beef in it, the, the beat where we could clap on our two and four and we could feel that the choir could swing to it, you know, and we could do our stuff. And so that's what we did. And um, it was really interesting because it opened great doors uh, for me to be able to minister into other cultures. And that was a, a very exciting phase of my life to minister in other cultures, which I still do. Uh, but I was greatly moved by the Andre Crouches, you know, that came out during that time. Andre Crouch uh, was a powerful, powerful um, impartation to my life. And then the, the Hawkins family, you know, everybody will remember the Hawkins family from Oh Happy Day. Oh Happy yeah. Day. Uh-huh, uh-huh, yeah. yeah. But that was not the only song that they did. You know, they had a whole <laughs> bunch of songs. Um, they had a, a ton of songs. Don't wait till the battle is over. Shout now, you know, all kinds of stuff, you know. Uh, just great songs that we did with our choir, but then we would go into these worship songs. So I didn't think about worship from a commercial standpoint. Mm -hmm. You know, where you guys, uh, y'all went out, y'all did the big concerts. To me, it wasn't about doing concerts. It was about singing in church right. because I had a whole um, agenda about singing. You know, to me, uh, singing was not something we did so that the preacher could come out and do his portion. Mm -mm. But singing was really bringing us into right alignment with God so we could hear his word and breaking up fallow ground. So we're ready for the impartation of the word. So we really take it home and it ingests, you know. We become uh, the word itself made incarnate, you know, just kind of thing. So it's uh, it's been a fun journey to do that and to see that and see that transition. But then all of a sudden, you know, I'm finding myself out here uh, influencing young guys like Israel. Uh, oh, how, yeah. You know, uh, my first recording that I did, all of my praise and worship stuff, was done through Carmen. Because actually, Carmen and I went to the same church in Tulsa. Uh, it was Carlton Pearson uh, was our pastor. Carlton Pearson had the Azusa Conference. The Azusa Conference would bring in 10,000 people a night to the Maybe Center there in Oral Roberts, uh, college university and uh we would do these great great services man it was powerful but i wrote all the praise and worship for those services you know and every year we would write a theme song so songs like you know coming to this house that carmen actually recorded and put his verses of his carmen rap on it <laughs> i hope you're listening carmen you were a great guy man and uh did his thing and uh really influenced a lot of young people to the lord during that time and uh, we actually ended up doing a tour together. Uh, but Carmen said, man, this praise and worship's got to be heard. So mm. he wanted to get it um, in a recorded format. And we did it through um, Star Song at the time. Yeah. And uh, it was interesting because they thought that I was a black guy. And they kept asking where he is. And when they finally figured out that I was this little white boy standing over there, they decided not to put my face on it, so it became Carmen's project. But that was originally supposed to be my first project. But it's all cool now, I mean, because that's all history. But um, we sang uh, all of those songs. That, and actually, you know, back in the day, man, Jeff, you know this. I mean, you know, gospel artists or CCM artists, if you sold 30, 50,000 units, man, there's a lot of recordings to sell, you know. That first uh, High Praises Volume 1, the first year it was out, sold 150,000 units. And uh, God really blessed it. And uh, we ended up doing it. And the guy that played the bass on there was none other than Mr. Fred Hammond. Mm -hmm. And uh, Fred Hammond played bass for me. In fact, all of Commission was my band um, for that recording. And then uh, went to uh, recording my voices there in Tulsa with the choir. And then I did my own recording in 95, and it was still a little praise and worship, but it was a more studio-produced praise and worship kind of thing. But um, Andre Crouch's background vocalist sang all my background vocals for that. Mm -hmm. It was really, really a great time. But um, those transitions uh, were very important. Then I'm finding myself, you know, here I've got Fred Hammond. All of a sudden, Fred's music changed from this techno uh, gospel that he was doing, which was incredible. To Fred's doing praise and worship. Yeah, he was. You know, Israel did praise and worship. All these guys, all these young guys were calling me and saying, hey, 
you know, can you uh, get with us and show us this or talk to us about this or do this with us or whatever. And it was great, great time. But I see that influence. I see what Jeff did was a great part of the journey. Mm -hmm. uh, because if he hadn't done that, I'm not really sure that we would have transitioned all the way through, you know. I think we might be still standing there singing other hymn books. Mm -hmm. But um, people will welcome, Scott. Yeah. <laughs> See there? <laughs> and again, nothing against the hymn books, man. The, I'm, I'm like, like Jeff said, I, I like the, the full hymns. buffet, yeah, man. Right. Yes. I love the hymns. Give man. me horizontal, the vertical, man, the hymn book. Yes, absolutely. We need it all. Absolutely. We, we did. really need it all. Really did. And uh, I think we should do more hymns in the church. I think we should do, because here's, here's my thing with hymnology is hymnology is a great way to pass accurate theology from one generation to the next. Yes. And uh, I think that's why that when we write our songs for all those praise and worship guys here watching tonight, uh, those young aspiring praise and worship leaders, write your songs accurate with the theology mm -hmm. of the scripture uh, because you don't want your kids singing something that is inaccurate with theology, and if you don't know the accurate theology, go sit down and, and play the song for your pastor. Ask him, where's the theology to back this up? This is what I feel, and I think it's vital. I think it's important, but I also think it's another reason why, if you're gonna write music, you should read the word a lot. I think that's important. <laughs> yeah, I tell you it was scary, because you know Jeff and I did a lot of different camps and all these things together, and uh, how many times I would be preaching read some scripture and students come up afterwards going that's actually a scripture because there's a song that says i'm like right. yeah you know yeah. that was a anyway yeah. that's and that is vital it's important it, you know? it truly is it, it, it truly, truly is, is. what well, every yeah. songwriter should owe uh at least the new testament if not the entire bible Authors a lot of back royalties. In my opinion. That's right. <laughs> they get to heaven. Paul's right. going to be going. That's so right. Right. <laughs> it's like one time I preached at a, at a church and this lady come running up to me. She goes, "Oh my God, that was so great tonight. Was that your revelation?" I said, "No, it was David's. <laughs> <laughs> I actually just read it and explained it to you." <laughs> uh, well, I love that. Well, guys, uh, we're so glad to have y'all. And, and I just want to echo what both of these guys said for that next generation that needs to be writing the songs. And when I say the next generation, I don't mean the next generation age-wise, but just the next chapter of those that are gonna be writing the songs, or even, can I say this, writing the blogs, uh, yeah. that it would have that that meat to it, that would be real, that would be authentic. I know um, I had certain times I just felt like a lot of the worship songs for a season were, let's put a bunch of Christian words in a Yahtzee jar and throw it out on the table, and oh, this word and this word, and that was that was the song. It's like there's no depth. It didn't yeah. seem like there's any, as you said, Be revelation to it. Of the craft, yeah. of songwriting. Be students of that craft. Don't just write something and throw it out there and just think that it's going to be good just because you put it together. And even if you do feel like God gave it to you, and you say, "Well, I feel like this is the way God really gave it to me," it is okay to sit down with somebody who is. Craft a craftsman, yeah, you know, and a songwriter, a wordsmith, and say, you know, this word would be better. I think you can do a better line here to explain. I get what you're saying, but it could be said better this way. Um, I think that's important, don't you, Jeff? Yeah, that you'd be teachable. I mean, I know a guy that you know he wrote a song, and, you know, he took it to the we were writing for the same publisher, and it wasn't the greatest song in the world. The cat's like the publisher guy who was a great, you know, teacher and helper. And, brought a lot of great insights and maybe you could try this. And the guy was like, you know what? This is how, this is the way God gave me the song. This is it, this is the song. Right. And the guy looked at him and said, look, I've been a Christian a long time. I can tell you, God is a better songwriter than that. <laughs> <laughs> I know he is right. Uh, so we gotta be uh, teachable and willing to. Yeah. yeah. And I would really concur. I have two things I have loved about what you've shared, Gary, that I think is great is that and what you do, one is I think it's great that worship music comes out of the church. Mm. Right. I think that that songwriters are being inspired by being involved in a local church community. Right. And not just looking at the Psalms as some sort of lyric book, you know? Right. Uh, I think when worship music is born out of good shepherding and mm. I think then there's I think 
think that's a powerful combination. Absolutely. And then I also think that um, it's, it, I think the scriptural accuracy, we were talking about this a little bit in the ride out to this lodge, I think that's really an important thing. As you're listening to the music that you listen to, that I listen to, make sure that it's scripturally accurate. And if it's not, don't listen to it. Yeah. You know, even even though it's an awesome song and it makes you feel good, you know, uh, you know, Taylor Swift song make a lot of people feel good. Whatever. There's plenty of music right. to make you feel good. It doesn't make it true. You right. know. And so yeah, when that's it comes to worship music, make sure that you're listening to music that's true, which to me is is scripturally accurate. Man, I love it. Well, guys, it's so good having both of these guys here with us, man, having Gary Oliver and, uh, man, having my buddy Jeff Moore. And thank you guys for joining us again. And, and again, if this thing has been a blessing to y'all, man, just as soon as it's over, if, if it's at work tonight, has it been good for you guys? I need to know. Give me some. There we go. All right, seeing a little luck. Thank you for that. This has been good. Man, hit, hit share. Hit share on the Facebook. Send it to over some other people. And if you know some people that maybe have got that desire to learn to write music, I think this has been an incredible word to have. These two guys here with us tonight sharing all the things, man, that, that they have been learning over the years. Get it into the hands of some of the people, man, that are writing this stuff. So, guys, again, we love y'all. Look forward to seeing y'all next Tuesday night on Last Words. 8 o'clock Tuesday night on Facebook. Man, God bless you guys. See you. Jesus.